I figured since I'm at a university, I'm going to put my professor hat on, okay? And you're going to be my class. Of course, this is the biggest class I think I've ever had. All right, are you ready? I want you to close your eyes, and I want you to think back to a time, either at home or at school, when you learn something about science that you will absolutely never forget. Something that engaged you, inspired you. I'll call it a gateway experience. Okay. All right, open your eyes. Now I want you to raise your hand if that gateway experience involved something that you could see, touch, hear, smell, taste. Raise your hand. Okay, all right, I see a lot of hands. Now, did anyone's memory involve looking at a computer screen? How about a phone? Okay, not as many hands, maybe a couple. So for me, my gateway experience when, was when I was about 10 years old. I grew up in inner city Pittsburgh, and our family, go Pittsburgh, <laughs> didn't have a lot of money, but you know, we, because of that, didn't go on vacation, didn't go to summer camp. So my backyard became my laboratory. And one day I was in class, and our science teacher told us that if you cut a planarian flatworm in half, it would regenerate. So, of course, that afternoon, went home, went into my backyard, looked for a bunch of wet rocks, found a planarian flatworm, this is a true story, and I cut that guy in half. Two weeks later, I now had two flatworms. So I can still remember that day like it was yesterday. He was small, black. I held that wet rock in my hand, and I was absolutely convinced that I wanted to do this for the rest of my life. Learn science by doing science. And that's when I decided to become a science teacher because I wanted to instill in my students that same love for science by doing science in school. But unfortunately, what I found out 34 years ago when I started teaching was that science classrooms did not look like that flatworm. They looked like this. It was a textbook. And what students were doing in classes was they were learning about words on a page and images. They weren't having those gateway experiences in science class. So I set out to change that. And today I direct the Smithsonian Science Education Center, where we believe in the power of physical objects. We believe that stuff holds the power to drive student learning. Now consider that apple. Have you ever wondered why the apple became the symbol for education? Over 200 years ago, families who had children on the frontier were responsible for feeding and housing teachers. And so providing an apple to a teacher was a way of providing sustenance and showing appreciation. Now, what if I wanted students to learn everything that they could about that apple? If I gave students the physical apple, the real apple, and the tools to discover its properties, they would learn so many things. All of these are actual observations. But what if I didn't have a real apple? What if all that I had was a plastic model of an apple? How many of those observations would they lose? And imagine if I didn't have a, even a plastic model, but all that I had was a digital image of the apple. What would they lose? What if I just gave them a word? So why is it that the physical object is so powerful? Physical objects help evoke those personal histories in us. They bring us back to our childhood, just like that flatworm did for me. You know, cognitive psychologists say that memory is closely tied to our perceptions, to those five senses, what we can see, touch, hear, smell, or taste. And these perceptions matter. Each perception is tied to a different part of our brain that's aligned with that sense. Whether it's a sound that you can hear, whether it's a red color or a rolling ball. 
And context matters just as much as perception. Can you hear that cricket? Imagine if you put that cricket inside of a terrarium in a classroom. That stimulates a different part of your neural activity than if all you did was let kids listen to that sound on a computer. And the stronger the perception and the more realistic the context, the more likely that they are to remember it. As one of my students once told me, and this is true, he said, it just sticks in your head. And yet today, physical objects are, are quickly being replaced by the digital. So in 1983, when I started teaching, if I wanted to take a picture, I used this. If I wanted to make a phone call, I used this. And if I wanted to listen to a song, guess what I used? I used this. And yet today, all of these things are now quickly in the palm of our hand. All of that information quickly accessible by the tip of our fingertips. Our entire existence is quickly becoming more digital than physical. You know, one study shows that elementary teachers are now using digital games for learning more than ever before. Another study showed that adults spend six hours per day online. And teenagers spend nine hours per day consuming media. No wonder we call them screenagers. <laughs> you know, digital technology is quickly becoming a central part of our lives. But in our digital world, we cannot lose sight of the importance of the tactile experience. I mean, it's not about resisting digital. There's a lot of important things about the digital world. We've been hearing about them this morning. But it is about the importance of bringing object-driven learning and digital learning together so that they complement one another. Objects matter. Stuff matters. You know, we humans were evolutionarily hardwired for having tactile experiences. Don't let your brains go there. Anyone with family or friends knows how important a tactile experience is. Imagine an emoji. It will absolutely never replace a real kiss. And Skype will never replace a real true hug. And just in case you think I'm an old timer who's stuck in my ways, I want you to consider these four examples. A few years ago, we thought that ebooks were going to quickly crowd out physical books. But guess what? Over the past years, ebook sales have been dropping. And here's the most surprising part. Guess who wants to spend less time on digital books? It's college students. They're asking for more tactile experiences. And consider vinyl records. According to The Guardian, vinyl record sales hit a 53% high in 2015. And with sales up and increasing, and why? Because we want to return to tangible music. And while video games are certainly more popular than board games, The Guardian reports that board game sales have risen 25 to 40% over the past four years. And ironically, 3D printers, they're also on the rise. Why? Because we're trying to turn the digital back into the physical. So there's little doubt that even as we lead more digital lives, we still crave, deeply crave, tactile experiences. And that's something that we know well at the Smithsonian Science Education Center. For over the past 30 years, we've been transforming the teaching and learning on science so that we can bring those gateway experiences into classrooms so that students do science. We engage them, inspire them, we help them learn science by doing science so that it sticks in their head. How many of you remember seeing the movie The Martian? Anyone? Do you remember this quote? You know, just like Matt Damon, we treat science like a verb, something you do. But that transformation did not happen overnight. You know, science education went through its own three-stage metamorphosis. 
Years ago, before the first satellite was ever launched into space in the late 1950s, science education was simply driven by words on a page and images. And in the classroom, students were given textbooks with definitions, define water. Or facts, 75% of Earth is made up of water. Objects aren't used for learning, and textbooks were simply called science. But that wasn't enough. Now, it's the late 1970s and 80s, and we gradually progressed to involve people with a physical object. This object-based learning is a good step forward. Students are being given the opportunity to engage with physical objects in order to better understand the properties of those objects. For example, we might ask students to work in group to examine the properties of water. We might give them this jar, for example. Ask them to notice that water takes the shape of the container that it's in. We might ask them to examine its clarity, take its temperature. Suddenly, students are now engaging with physical objects in order to construct their learning based on those perceptions of those interesting objects. And now suddenly, science is no longer, those science textbooks, they're no longer called science, they're called water. And the focus is now on the stuff. But the stuff is still removed from the context of its environment. So it's not that object-driven learning didn't work, it's that the objects were removed from, from the connection of real-world phenomenon. So fast forward to today. Now we give students water and we ask them engaging questions about the phenomenon. We might say, how much of the water, if it were all the water on Earth, would be fresh? Only two and a half percent. And most of that is tied up in glaciers. Science education now puts the object into the broader context. It's now what we call phenomenon-based learning. And at the same time, teachers are also asking students to solve complex problems using that science. For example, we might ask, what are some of the ways that we might move that fresh water from where it is to where we need it? such as in South Sudan. Suddenly, it's no longer just about the water. It's about the story that surrounds the water. The water is now set into the context of a socio-political problem. And suddenly, the stuff is now the story. Now that book is no longer just called science or water, but how do we bring fresh water to those in need? Digital tools are then used to bring students to places that are too large, too complex, too far away, too small for them to be able to observe firsthand. Today, students are engaging with scientific phenomenon and designing solutions to complex problems in a multimodal environment, combining the physical and the digital so that students can construct their own knowledge just like scientists do. You know, at the Smithsonian, we, we have a lot of stuff. We have over 154 million objects in our collection. From the ancient Chinese bronze to the Star Spangled Banner, to a three and a half billion year old fossil to the Apollo lunar landing module. And we also study stuff. Our scientists and our researchers engage in our collections to better understand the world and to share that with others. The Smithsonian, like any educational institution, is also going through its own metamorphosis. We are now digitizing millions of our objects and going through a digital first strategy so that we can get those objects to others, while at the same time preserving the physical. So this is one of our objects in our collection. We are now creating 3D images of those objects that looks like this, so that we can bring something that's safe, error-free, cost-effective. We can get it to millions of people instantaneously. And that's great. A lot of people will never step foot through the Smithsonian's walls. And so we're bringing those physical objects to them. 
But in a classroom, when there's an opportunity to engage students with both the physical and the digital objects, here's what research says. You get a learning boost by using physical objects to engage students and enhance their perceptions, while at the same time helping to put it into the context of a real-world phenomenon. Then you use the digital to follow it. That's what the research says. So I leave you with this. It's a story about a young teacher to whom we sent some of our hands-on materials to. This teacher had a young girl in her classroom who did not speak in class all year. She never spoke to the teacher, and she never spoke to the other students, but she would speak at home. So one day in the spring, the teacher told the students that she would be getting this organisms unit from the Smithsonian any day. And when it finally came, the teacher went around the room, and she put gloves on all of her little students' hands, and she took out the millipedes that were in this kit. And when she went around the room, she placed that millipede in that little girl's hand, and the little girl spoke for the first time. She looked down at the millipede, and she said, Wow, Mrs. Brown, this is awesome. And then she turned to her partners, and she proceeded to have a full conversation with them. That was that little girl's gateway experience. And most likely, it was the teacher's too. So when I began this talk, I asked you to close your eyes and to think back to a time that you learned something about science that you will never forget, something that engaged you, inspired you. Most of you said that that gateway experience involved a physical object. You had your millipede, just like I had my flatworm. And so 20 years from now, if you are ever on a stage like this, in front of an audience like I am, and you ask them to close their eyes and to think back to their gateway experience, despite the exponential rise in digital learning, I guarantee you that they too will say that a physical object somehow, somewhere, transform their lives. Thank you.